kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war hangers. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Bustin' Loose, released May 22, 1981. It was written by Roger L. Simon, based on an adaptation by Lonnie Elder III and a story by Richard Pryor, directed by Oz Scott with uncredited work from Michael Schultz and released by Universal Pictures. The working title was Family Dream. I don't really understand the title. Um, Bust and Loose. Well, Bus. Bus. Yeah. Oh, I, I never made that association. I thought it was Bust and Loose. Like, had to do, it, it Dancing, has, you would think? Or? No, I thought it had something to do with getting out of prison. But I, like, I'm like, that's such a not key part of this like being yeah. it's not like he escaped prison well it was very late in the game that they changed the title it was it was in post for the entire production it was going to be called family dream so which i don't i wish it's I also like, a terrible i title. like even worse yeah. than bust and loose but yeah. I, I guess i never really understood why they called it bust and loose i think it was just supposed to sound exciting a little bit it, and then it have, sure is and have <laughs> a remotely punny explanation Initially, Richard Pryor was set to direct, but I couldn't figure out why that changed. Drugs. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it was drugs. That was an issue with uh, Stir Crazy. Isn't there some rule about lead actors directing? No. Uh, the rule is that if you start with a director that is not an actor, that you can't switch to an actor from the film. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. But he was the... He was the writer or the story by he, he he wrote the story that was adapted by someone else into the screenplay okay when cicely tyson was offered the role she initially turned it down because she was uncomfortable with the vulgar language that Pryor used in his stand-up which may or may not have inspired an aspect of her character in the film right <laughs> the theme song just when i needed you was written by luther vandross and performed by miss roberta flack it began production in 78 and sat on the shelf until the 1980 success of stir crazy which inspired producers to finally release the film after a series of reshoots. Shortly after production wrapped on Stir Crazy, on the evening of June 9th, 1980, Pryor was using drugs in his home, which inspired a bout of psychosis, during which Pryor attempted suicide by dousing himself in 151-proof rum and then lighting himself on fire. Jesus. He ran down the block on fire until he was subdued by police officers. Second and third degree burns covered more than half of his body, Pryor participated in reshoots soon after his release from the hospital, and as a result, according to some critics, the difference between the 70s material and 80s material is apparent in his performance. So this was before Stir Crazy. It was originally filmed before it. The, well, the production was shot before Stir Crazy, and the reshoots were shot after Stir Crazy. Okay. Like they said, I think I read that it was 50% of the yeah. film had been reshot. Just about. Oh, really? Yeah. Because Pryor was not happy with the flatness of the original cut, the reshoots were handled by a different director, Michael Schultz, who had worked with Pryor previously on Car Wash in 76, and Which Way Is Up and Greased Lightning in 77. He worked with him prior? <laughs> yes. <laughs> prior, prior films. Schultz had proposed reshooting the entire film, but Universal kept it to 50% of the finished product. Oh, I'm still surprised they did 50%. Yeah, it's again. a lot. I, I don't know if they shot everything except for the kids a second time because the kids don't seem to have yeah. aged three years mm -hmm. yeah so i would think that basically any scene that takes place that doesn't involve the children hmm. could have been part of the reshoot i don't feel like i mean i wasn't looking for it but i didn't feel like i noticed any discrepancies in his performance yeah i i was looking for it and i didn't see it except that um for the whole scene at the beginning he's wearing a turtleneck where the burn marks were visible on his uh. chest and neck. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily was intentional to cover things up because it seems to be the uniform of the store that they're going yeah, to. But it's al but it's also like winter. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Yeah. It so there's, there's out of place. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think um, because he doesn't have 
really bad scarring on his face from the burn, I think that it doesn't actually affect the performance that much. Yeah. Oh, must have been. Uh, I would think that the the scene where he gets lit on fire is slightly more traumatic. There's a lot of really disturbing points in this movie when you consider the fact that he set himself on fire between the production and the reshoots. Yeah. But we'll we'll touch on each of them as we get to them. Uh, this is actually not the first time that we've seen Pryor post accident, because his first major public appearance was during the Academy Awards, where he and Jane Seymour presented the Oscar for Best Editor to Thelma Schoonmacher for editing Raging Bull. This knowledge explains the long-standing ovation that Pryor got when he took the stage during the ceremony that I didn't understand uh. at the time. Six years after the film was released, a TV series was adapted from the story, but only lasted a season, starring Jimmy Walker from Good Times. This actually feels more like a TV show it does. than a movie yeah. anyways. <laughs> we start in Philadelphia at night. A truck pulls up to a freight yard, and Joe Braxton, as played by Richard Pryor, steps out. He looks around suspiciously for a moment, and then withdraws a stroller from the cab of the truck and carries it up a flight of stairs to the main office. The guard in the office appears distracted by a television show. Joe picks a lock on a door and pushes his way in. He rounds a corner on his hands and knees and comes face to face with a Doberman guard dog. He gives the dog a three musketeer bar to kill it, and we cut to <laughs> <laughs> and we cut to the next day. Now, I'm sure that there was more to this scene the way they shot it originally because why was he carrying a stroller up the stairs know. and why is that the end of the moment you distracted the dog and the dog walked away from you he could have yeah. done whatever he was here to do so i'm convinced that this scene went a different way and they decided okay he'll give the chocolate bar to the dog and then we'll cut to the next day and we'll write a whole new scene that will be the uh, thing that he gets in trouble for oh that makes more sense because i was i was gonna ask i'm like i don't understand like is he preparing for what happens the yeah next day? because they, they try to explain it away with some dialogue here and it doesn't really make a lot of sense joe and a friend named marvin played by the late great paul mooney are carrying a sign across the street that reads quaker state audio and video 12 outlets to serve you throughout the greater philadelphia area you couldn't even pull that job off last night. How you gonna do this in broad daylight? Last night they had a dog. Today I got you. They hang the sign on the side of a van and head over to a loading dock in an alley. It's it's obviously not the same place. Well, yeah. and like, spoiler alert, their plan here is to steal a bunch of audio visual equipment. Right. As if they're delivery men, but like that's... I, I don't think he could have carried a single one of those televisions or stereos with a stroller. Yeah, out by the, himself. Yeah, yeah, it's like so. I, I'm what convinced. Was your plan? <laughs> yeah, whatever he was going to take the night before, there was a reason for the stroller that was going to that would have made more sense than what we saw happen. Well, and would he have had to have gone back out the same way? Yeah, is like, he going to take a, a dolly TV with a widescreen on it? Yeah. yeah, and and you can't load a whole truck like that. You're going to go up and down these stairs with a stroller a yeah. hundred times. Joe tries to joke around with the man at the back of the warehouse, but he has no sense of humor. The man leads Joe into the warehouse and through a crowded showroom where a wall of televisions broadcast a local news item about the Claremont Center for Children, which is closing after decades of operation due to budget cuts in the city's welfare office. Now, so far, all of the children have been relocated, with the exception of eight in the home special education unit. Joe is introduced to the showroom manager, who is giving me Gil Bellows vibes. Joe takes advantage of what appears to be a reverse racism situation where the guy believes every silly lie Joe tells him because he's black and he doesn't want to offend him by not believing him. Joe gives the man a fake order number for the delivery they're here to collect and the manager can't get it to load on his computer. Now it's jammed. Damn, damn. You know it's going to take a week for him to fix this, man. I mean, a black man can't stand a week off. You know what I mean? Hey, you got to help me out. I won't hold you up, man. Luke, give him whatever he needs. Ooh, you all right, brother. I mean that. You got soul. And a say. All right, so man. We get one last glimpse of the news story as special ed teacher Vivian Perry, as played by Cicely Tyson, describes the struggles facing the eight remaining children for the reporter. What kind of problems are we talking about? The children in the special unit have very unique problems. There's blindness, lameness, pyromania learning disabilities one of them one of them was even forced into prostitution in vietnam at the age of nine 
Yeah, I was like, what? Yeah, that's super dark for this movie already. Yeah, it doesn't get better, that one. <laughs> yeah. If I had to choose lameness for sure, I was lame as a kid, so. You're still lame. Yeah. But also, none of them seem to have issues with m- movement when we see them later, so. That's true. Is one of them lame? <laughs> Joe talks Lou into loading the truck with assorted televisions. Melvin is terrified in the driver's seat that they'll be caught at any moment. Lou heads back to the manager and advises him to at least check the registration of Joe's truck before trusting him with all this merchandise, and Joe starts shouting about being racially profiled. Joe grabs a flat screen to run it out to the truck, but before he can get to it, Marvin's patience runs out and he drives off with the back of the truck open, dropping dozens of TVs in the street. Well, you should make a point here when he says he grabs a flat screen he actually grabs a just the flat screen yeah screen yeah not a flat screen television that's true because it's a projection Correct. screen so he's literally just grabbing the screen that it would be projected on there's no mm. cords or anything that makes way more sense because i couldn't figure out what he was dragging because i'm like that looks real flat what is that <laughs> yeah that's super <laughs> fancy there's no wires and it's like yeah. a millimeter thick uh yeah when he walks in he walks in front of it and you get a you see a silhouette on it um but when he grabs the flat screen and walks out the other two guys the store clerk and the loading manager grab the projector you can see that they're well and it's one of those big frenzel lens things like those things were massive like we've seen in the visitor or in middle age crazy yeah middle age Mm -hmm. crazy he had that funky curvy screen but this looked good like i mean it looked good even caught on camera yeah um, I, I don't know how they, they did that because my experience with those types of te- televisions... The refresh rate doesn't match up. Well, that and if you're not standing or sitting in the exact spot <laughs> that you yeah. need to see it on that projection, Ugh. you get like this weird distortion. Is that like when I watched Avatar in the Dome in 3D? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we were like off to the that right. That was awful. <laughs> and so none of the 3D worked because no. the picture was wrapped around the room in a big mm-hmm. curve. Lou is happy to find his suspicions confirmed and knocks Joe out with a single punch. We cut to the Claremont Center for Children, where Donald Kinsey, as played by Robert Christian, arrives to pick up Vivian Perry. She tells him her plan to stay with the kids for tonight, and she's arranging a ride to her aunt's farm outside of Seattle, where she expects they can be properly cared for. Donald is skeptical that she can get approval to transport them across state lines, but apparently she already got permission, she says. She asks Donald to find a driver to move the kids in a broken down school bus from Philly to Seattle. So is she just adopting these kids? I don't understand what's happening. Well, I mean, they're in the state's care, I guess. So I don't know if she... Well, they won't be if they're in a different state. That's true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't understand. They're just being like, I'm going to give you these kids other state. Yeah, that is weird. (laughs) I mean, I guess if they are somehow classifying this farm as some kind of... uh, not rehabilitation center, but uh, like some kind of learning like a, environment, a like foster home type place. Or? Yeah, it's a rehabilitation. It's just it's a place that they're being transferred to, but as right. a part of the same system. Right, but I none guess of these have kids have none though. of these kids have parents that they're going right. back right. to, yeah. so it's okay that they're no longer here. But because it's also a farm, like maybe that they're getting some kind of training as potential farmers like yeah working with animals earning like, a life skill club. <laughs> well, well i mean i I'm, I'm like really grasping at straws because i, I it doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> we cut right to the courtroom of judge antonio ranzuli the judge informs joe what kind of sentence he could be looking at based on the criminal record that dates back to early childhood and gestures to donald in the back of the courtroom as his parole officer we get an insert of joe doing some quick thinking and he decides on reverse psychology claiming that he committed the crimes on purpose in an effort to be sent back to prison and insisting that the judge lock him up for a minimum 20 years, whatever it takes to keep him away from that terrible parole officer. Plus he gets three square meals a day, a place to sleep. Yeah. Do you recall the last time we saw Richard Pryor arguing for a different sentence in court? Uh, I would... Was it stir crazy? Yeah, Yeah, it was was stir crazy. crazy. (laughs) I I thought it was... was, (laughs) It was like... I was like wasn't the 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 marty feldman one no <laughs> yeah like we just talked he's barely him. in the other two stir crazy is the only one he's the main character of so far in the back of the courtroom donald stifles a laugh and we are led to understand that donald is in fact a pushover but joe has already tricked the judge the judge calls for 10 years probation 
and as Joe is dragged out of the courtroom, he screams for someone to send him to jail. Donald congratulates Joe on the show, but asks for a favor in exchange for not informing the judge of his shenanigans. We cut to Joe working under a beat-up school bus. He's laughing at what a mess it is. Well, Joe, how's it look? I mean, it's a piece of shit. Vivian argues that they have until Friday to find another car, and in the ensuing argument, Joe breaks character and admits that Donald specifically asked him to claim that the bus was inoperable so that Vivian would abandon this child transport plan. The next day, Joe tries to visit Donald's office, but his secretary asks Joe to wait a moment, so he hits on her for a while. To punish Joe for ratting on him, Donald makes him choose. They can call Judge Renzulli right now and arrange for a new prison sentence, or Joe can fix and drive the bus to Seattle. Okay, so I am going to question frequently in this film Donald's motivations. Yeah, because I thought you didn't want them to go, but yeah. now you're making him fix the bus and drive. Yes. It. So originally he's like telling him, okay, do me this favor, lie and say this bus doesn't work and we're good, we're square or whatever it is. But so he's trying to get Vivian to stay. Is that because he doesn't want the children gone or because he just wants her around? I think he just wants her around. So it has nothing to do with whether or not the kids stay or go. He I don't think he actually cares leave. about the kids. He just doesn't okay. want his girlfriend to leave. Okay. Because I, I then get really confused about what happens with him later. Yes. <laughs> but now he's doing the opposite. Right. Like, now I do want you to drive the bus, but it, but the... If he doesn't drive the bus, then no one drives the bus, and he still gets what he Well, wants. I'm sure the Vivian would just work to find another driver. She, she, I guess, but it seems like she doesn't do a whole lot of she stuff. She just expects other people to do the stuff? Yeah. That's true. We cut to the children's center as the bus rattles into the parking lot. The children are directed onto the bus, and they speak with Joe as they climb aboard. A girl, Samantha, carrying a large teddy bear makes a quick assessment of Joe based on a single handshake. Definite schizoid personality with homosexual tendencies. Which actually sounds fairly accurate for Pryor. A few more kids fight with each other on their way into the bus. A young girl, Linda, seems to be a pathological liar who also can't stop talking. A blind kid, Harold, in sunglasses, tries to hop in the driver's seat and Joe has to shout him to the back of the bus. Get out of my seat, man! I can drive! Tell him everybody, can I drive? I will love to drive. He's always... I don't care. Drive drive your ass to the back of the bus. Do that. Another kid tells Joe that Joe promised to take him fishing, which obviously confuses Joe, who has never met any of these kids before. This is Julio, who thinks that he was promised a fishing trip. When Vivian finally notices the kids giving him a hard time, she shoves the last of them onto the bus. The last kid to board is Annie, the former child prostitute. Hi, sailor. My name's Annie. What's yours? My name's Excuse Joe. me. Joe tries to light a cigar to kick off the drive, but immediately Vivian throws it out the window. And when Joe steps outside to get it back, he sees angry Donald and turns around to get right back on the bus. So Donald is there to give Joe, I guess, some kind of traveling permit. Oh, is that I, why he showed up in this parking lot? I guess. Because um, also, I imagine you need some kind of like specialized license to drive a bus full of children. Yes, for sure you do. Um, but then he also gives him a return bus ticket to come back to Philadelphia. Yeah. And he says you have 15 days. And I was wondering if that 15 days includes the bus trip back. Yeah, I, I think, would think I think so. so because yeah. Because Philadelphia is not 15 days from Seattle. <laughs> right. But is he just going to take a plane back? Or are they going to leave the bus there in Seattle? Well, he's taking a, he's taking, I, I assume like a Greyhound bus back because yeah. he's got a bus ticket. Oh, okay. Um, but this is the last time that we will mention the ticking clock of 15 days. Right. right. Yeah, that's true. Which, which I kept thinking, like, like he was going to be, like, meticulously, like, trying to keep on schedule. Like, things were going to be, like, set back and he was going to bring it up. But we never but bring it up But it's not like again. we've established some reason that he has to get back to Philadelphia, though. But then why bring it up? Like, he's given a deadline. Like, like I think just because at the beginning of the film, we're not assuming that he has a reason to stay with the kids. So they're just, like, for the people watching the movie, like... Well, they didn't give him a return ticket, so what is he supposed to do? Just live there? Mm. And, yeah. Donald hands Vivian a rose just before they get on the road. It's not a rose. It's a carnation. <laughs> I know that our nation is full of cars. He gives her a rose. I Well, I specifically <laughs> noted that it was a carnation because I'm like, 
who the hell buys a single carnation to give to somebody? Like, that's like the cheapest flower there that's is. That's why. <laughs> I think that we're trying to set some some hints about this character at the beginning. You know, it could be something special to the two of them. Oh, it's an inside joke? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> who gives a carnation? <laughs> it's a prank. She hates carnations. But, well, because <laughs> later on, Richard Pryor will give her a dandelion that he picked versus... A carnation I think that that, he that is probably that is probably a sweeter gesture than buying a carnation. How do you know he didn't find that carnation <laughs> in a field? <laughs> Once they get moving, Vivian thinks she can coerce the kids to do some schoolwork, but one at a time, the kids all toss their textbooks out the window on a bridge. A group of kids swarm Joe in the driver's seat when Vivian isn't looking, and one of them is able to snag his wallet in the encounter, but immediately returns it. Joe warns them away by claiming his prison time was for murder and flipping open a switchblade so the kids scatter. I was waiting for this to come back. I'm yeah. like, oh no, you showed them you have a switchblade. They reach their first night stop at a small motel. Annie asks to spend the night with Joe while Vivian is assigning rooms. She informs Joe that there is not a room for him and he'll be sleeping on the bus and we get the standard sitcom moment that tvtropes.org calls a Gilligan cut where a character vehemently refuses to do something multiple times I am not sleeping on no goddamn bus. I'm not sleeping on no bus. I am not sleeping on no bus. And we hard cut to Joe sleeping on the makeshift hammock between rows of seats on the bus. He is rudely awoken by the persistent knocking of Vivian at the bus door because three of the boys have run away from the motel in the middle of the night. Joe tells her in no uncertain terms that he doesn't care and it's not his job to keep these kids safe. Vivian asks, in the absence of his help finding the boys, if he can at least watch the kids that haven't run away until she gets back, and again he refuses. <laughs> it's not until she threatens to involve Donald that he asks for a room number. But he still doesn't budge, and mm -hmm. she wakes him up again seconds later. And then we cut to more time later, and he's still sleeping on the bus. He's not watching the kids he's supposed to yeah. be watching. And Samantha with the teddy bear is banging on a window. She's here because Linda locked the door to the motel bathroom, and her teddy bear Dakota has to pee. Obviously he doesn't care and he tells her so, but she keeps knocking and eventually she drags Joe back to the kids' room where he finds the pyromaniac child lighting a tower of matches. <laughs> it, it is like a full stack. Like, yeah, reminds, it's like a Jenga stack of matches. Yeah, it reminds me of these videos where people build giant like things out of matches and then light them on fire now. <laughs> Linda informs Joe that in the past, this kid, Anthony, started a fire that killed his parents and burned his house down. Anthony vehemently denies the accusation. Meanwhile, across the room, another kid, Ernesto, I think, has disassembled the motel room TV and sparks blast forth from the screen, and it also catches fire. So that's a lot of fire around so Richard far, Pryor lots already. Of fire. But these these are shots with kids. So right. maybe this is prior to the prior prior, prior incident. Prior. Joe decides to distract them with something less dangerous and settles on a game of strip poker. With a bunch of children. Yeah. <laughs> My next sentence is literally, strip poker with a bunch of children. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why, like, it, why, why, why wasn't it just regular poker? I think this was close to on the heels to Bad News Bears. And they were like, we got to push the envelope. We got to make it something that's inappropriate. And unless he's going to literally split a bottle with these kids, let's do something that we could play off as harmless later. Because uh, he doesn't actually rape any of the kids here. <laughs> he just plays strip poker with them. Yes, but asking kids to remove clothing, even if they don't. Because what, they what else could he have done that would have been considered inappropriate by an audience, but wouldn't have affected our opinion of him? I don't know. I mean, just any type of regular gambling, you know, just regular poker, three card Monty. Like No, you got to get the kids to take some clothes off. Uh, we got to see some skin here. Because like not everybody can win strip poker right because i get i get that like we could we could we could cut to him not wearing clothes right but correct me if i'm wrong i'm not a poker player but only one person wins every hand therefore everybody else every hand that they're losing has unless to people lose fold early clothing we still have to you still have to ante up right no, i'm talking about folding your clothes <laughs> <laughs> But in the, uh, so. <laughs> and we already have a little blind. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and we'll see the river later. Is that a poker joke? I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because 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 there's a blind kid. Okay. But oh no, he's the one at the arcade though. Damn it, doesn't work. Is he? To, yeah, he's yeah, one he's, of the kids yeah, at the arcade. That's a he's weird choice to take. <laughs> No, he that's can't a, play that's and joke, he can't though. watch people. That's the joke oh, okay. when we cut to that scene. Oh, okay. We cut away to a local arcade where Vivian quickly locates the three missing boys. She drags them back to the motel where she finds Joe in onesie pajamas with Dakota, the teddy bear, trying to talk the kids out of the closet with his clothes. <laughs> where are the children? What's going on here? They were... T- there they are. Why are they in the closet? We and were... why are you half dressed in here? It's uh, Halloween. Why were they in the closet? Uh, because they took all of his clothes and they were trying to keep them away from him. And the best way to do that is on the other side of a door because otherwise it's a wrestling match. Yeah, but then you're stuck in the closet. It's not a fun game unless he has to be out and about. In it's his funny because he's trapped somewhere. I guess you're you're saying it would be better if oh, he was outside the, the door. Yeah, go out the front door. That would be funny. And take the kids. That, yeah, that was take, That's take a missed opportunity for sure. <laughs> We cut to a driving montage, and we see a quick insert of Annie drawing a farm as they move through the country. They cross the state line into Illinois at night. They stop at another motel, where the kids are for some reason allowed to just wander around the premises on their own, despite a history of intentional disappearances. Also, they're not making very good time. No, they're not. (laughs) It took them two days to get to Illinois from Pennsylvania. Yeah. (laughs) Joe works on the bus while Vivian reiterates to Donald over the phone her commitment to the children. Interspliced with this scene, we see Anthony in a field of hay, lighting a big bundle of hay on fire. Joe notices the fire first and knocks repeatedly on Vivian's phone booth to draw it to her attention. Eventually, the flames get big enough that Joe runs off screaming and Vivian follows him. As Joe struggles to put out the fire, Anthony wrestles him away, not wanting him to destroy the flames. Joe shoves him to the ground and the kid repeatedly tosses handfuls of hay into the fire. Inexplicably, Joe uses his tiny baseball cap to swat at these huge flames, as though that would help, and suddenly finds himself at the end of a farmer's shotgun barrel. But he, like, as he's whacking his f- the hat onto the flames, the hat catches on fire, yep. and he puts it back on his head. Yes, yeah. he does. And this is very upsetting to me. Yeah. Yeah, and then when he takes it off, his hair is smoldering. You can tell he actually burned his hair. Well, with that's what hat. I was yeah. going to say. Like, did he must have actually lit himself on fire, yep. because it seemed... Like that was not, an, it was not a gag for the movie. No, but I also don't think it was an accident. I think he didn't care. Like he, he cared enough about getting the joke right that he let his hair burn for a second. Oh my God. Joe and Vivian try to explain that the fire was started by a child and that they're trying to take care of it. The farmer demands that they compensate him for what can't be more than 10 cents worth of burnt hay. Joe gives him a 20. As Vivian walks Anthony away from the scene, the kid repeatedly shouts, Burning! No, no, Anthony, listen. She's you mustn't think burning. That. She's all right, Anthony. She's, she's all burning. right. Please, believe it was me. She's all right. No, she wasn't. She wasn't. Probably remembering what happened to his mother in the accident that orphaned him, Joe seems particularly disturbed by the scene. I'm particularly disturbed by yeah. the scene. I, I don't... It seems odd to me that a child who had that traumatic experience would want to be playing with fire again. i think he he had the pyromania before that like it's it's an unconscious need to play with fire oh that and, resulted and it caused in the, the accident yeah. okay back on the road joe is forced to stop the bus so that dakota the teddy bear can go to the bathroom again stopped again on the side of the road while joe makes some repairs to the bus vivian chats with the kids about the farm they're headed to she tells samantha the owner of dakota the teddy bear that when she was a kid she used to climb the trees on the farm and she scarred her wrist falling out of one She tells the kids that her aunt gave her a big hug and a slice of blackberry pie to cheer her up. Joe seems enamored by her chemistry with the children. A thunderstorm rolls in and the kids move into the bus while Joe tries to fix it from underneath in the deepening puddles of rain. When he seems finished, he climbs into the driver's seat, but he can't get the bus to move because it's stuck in the mud now. Joe exits the bus again to put something under the tires to help them escape. He seems especially annoyed at how much fun all the kids are having in the midst of his work. He slips in the mud and falls on his ass, which cracks the kids up inside even more. Vivian tries the gas before she gets a cue from Joe, and the tires throw mud in his face. Joe decides to head down the road to a nearby building for help. As he walks down the road talking to himself, he accidentally crosses paths with a troop of Ku Klux Klansmen. Joe and the Klansmen with their torches head back to the school bus. 
Vivian's obviously disturbed to see Klansmen approaching the van, but Joe steps into the bus first to assure everyone that everything's okay. Harold, the blind kid, yanks the hood off the lead Klansman, and when the man gets upset, Joe assures him that the child is blind. What are you doing? He's, He's blind! He's blind! All the kids are blind! All of them! They're blind! I'm taking them to the hospital! I'm just trying to take them to the hospital. They need an operation. All the kids start feigning blindness, reaching around, <laughs> smacking each other in the face. Joe tells the man they're headed to the Ray Charles Institute for the Blind <laughs> and that he may have heard about it on Oral Roberts. The man offers the strength of his men to push their bus out of the mud and get them on their way. Joe gives the man a big kiss on the face, which he seems upset about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I got like Slim Pickens vibes from this guy. Like yeah. I felt like that would have been a good choice for this casting here too. He gets the bus started as the men push, and they have to rock it back and forth a couple of times before it breaks loose, but all the clansmen fall face first into the mud, staining their sheets. All the kids crowd the back window to laugh at the men, giving away the game that they are not blind. I think it's a weird choice. What? That I... <sighs> That even though I mean, like I get that the gag is that they fall in the mud and their their white robes are all dirty afterwards, and 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 we're laughing at them, but the the KKK just saved the day. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it was it was a trope in the eighties that Klansmen would show up and that they would all be embarrassed, you know, that something dumb would happen to them. I guess, but they these people would still be stuck in the mud and unable to go if they weren't here. Like, I yeah. just think it's weird that we we gave them that redeeming moment. We made them heroes, moment. yeah. It is, it's an odd choice. The Klansmen agree to keep the secret between themselves that this all happened. The next day, on the road, we can see that all the kids are polishing Joe's tools that were covered in mud the night before. The bus climbs up into the mountains and through snow. Julio, the kid who keeps talking about fishing notices a lake and reminds Joe of the promise that he never made to take them fishing. At first, Joe reminds him that he made no such promise, but eventually gives up and agrees to take them fishing. Vivian tells them they don't have the equipment, but Joe decides to MacGyver some. We don't have fishing equipment. Ladies, you're looking at a man who can catch a whale with a toothpick. You kidding me? We're going fishing. We cut to Joe putting a worm on a hook at the end of a string tied to a stick, and he uses it to fish from a dock. Right away, Joe has caught something, and when he swings it around to show the kids, Samantha falls into the water. I love that he actually caught something and yeah. immediately. Like, mm -hmm. like when he's just like, I could do this. He wasn't actually exaggerating. He's like, he could totally fish. And, and he, he doesn't seem shocked by it either. It's not yeah. a moment where he's like, oh my God, I really caught something. It's like, yeah, I knew I could do this. Yeah. Well, because he, he seems like he's very capable. Like, he's been keeping the bus fixed yeah, and he's um, doing all kinds of work on it. Like, I don't even know what he was doing with the... It looked like he had the whole transmission off of the bus, and he was, like, sawing it in half. He was a muffler. A muffler. He had the whole muffler off, and he was <laughs> sawing it in half. Um, uh, I, I can't take credit for this, because I read it some. I read it in one of my bits of research, but people were comparing it to the relationship between Hepburn and Bogart in The Afternoon sure. Queen. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they're constantly, like, trying to fix the boat. Yeah, and the boat is the bus, yeah, for yeah. sure. But Samantha falls in the water and Joe jumps in to grab her and he rushes her back to the dock. He's treading water as they pull Samantha up and he shouts to the kids that he can't swim. Miss Vivian dives in to save him. She quickly realizes that the water is only four feet deep here and he just tricked her into jumping in the water. The kids think this prank is hysterical, but Vivian is less amused until she sees the humor in the situation when she's surrounded by laughing children. These kinds of scenes are so much funnier before cell phones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're just like, oh my God, all their technology is broken. <laughs> Later, we see them pull the bus into another motel. Linda shows Joe a drawing of the bus that Annie did and invites him to use it as guidelines for how to fix the bus. <laughs> like, this is what the bus should look like. Mm -hmm. Look, see the hood's down. And that one too, it's got to be like this. This is in fact even prettier than that one. You've got to put that one down so it looks at least a little better. I'm going to put it down if I'm fixing the spark plugs. Why don't you, you take it down? I don't want to take a hike. Linda leaves Joe and Annie together, and things get uncomfortable. Annie starts making vague offerings to Joe about whatever he wants. She's halfway through offering to join him in one of the motel's rooms when he finally realizes what she's talking about, and he flips out on her pretty harshly, which she misinterprets his anger for not liking her, and he tries to explain the difference between liking someone and wanting to go to bed with them. Vivian notices the argument and approaches them quickly. Joe continues shouting down every comment Annie tries to make until she's crying. 
She begs him not to tell Vivian, and he agrees not to if she promises not to offer herself to people that way in the future. Vivian overhears the whole conversation, but she doesn't intrude. Joe picks up the drawing of the bus and reminds Annie that she's genuinely talented. He tells her if she could draw the bus a little smaller, he'd hang it on the dash, and she agrees to. Vivian is on the verge of tears when she approaches Joe to thank him for his response, but he doesn't want to hear it. Joe, I'm not a social worker. I'm not! I just drive the bus. This scene really got me. Yeah. Like, I, I, the, his performance of that line, yeah. like, almost brought me to tears because you're just like, he's really feeling for these kids at this point, and that's really upsetting. But I also like that that he's like angry at her, but in and he knows the the point that she's about to make is that he did the right thing or that he's that he's helping, and she appreciates that response. But he's just trying to tell her, I wish you didn't even put me in this situation. I don't yeah. want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. Later that night, Vivian knocks on Joe's motel room door, and he rushes around the room to try and disguise the smell of cigar. He's wearing a bathrobe when he answers the door, and he tucks the cigar into a pocket still lit. She coughs immediately on the cigar smoke in the room and asks what he's been up to tonight since he skipped dinner with the group. I'm not sure if she's coughing on the cigar smoke or the heavy layer of aerosol that he's spraying. Oh, maybe. It could be either one. (laughs) Joe puts his hands in his pockets and burns them on the cigar, which he then pulls out, amusing Vivian. Oh, hey. (laughs) Set yourself on fire. No, I'm sorry. Oh, God. Ugh. Like, that's, that's one of two lines in this movie where I'm like, that's insane that this mm-hmm. was this before or after is this a reshoot because the kids aren't in this scene he's in a bathrobe like it's not like a high neck thing at all i feel like it i, I don't know it just reshoot. i i hope that this is from the original thing because having her say that line after the accident seems like such a terrible choice unless they're doing it on purpose because they want Cause they want to the, make the, a joke yeah they want to make mm-hmm. light of it they both sit down, and Vivian tries again to thank him for how he dealt with Annie. You know, I was Listen, in, you it know, could have gone either way. I know, but I acted like an ass. You handled it beautifully. When she finally turns to leave the room, there's a knock at the door, and Donald enters. He's obviously upset to find them in a motel room together, especially with Joe in a bathrobe. Vivian is offended by the tone of Donald's questioning and leaves for her room. How did he find them? I mean, I guess he knows the path that they're going to take. I don't know, maybe they planned out their hotel rooms in advance or the motels in advance. I mean, maybe. maybe. They have stopped for extended periods of time, so you I mean, would expect that they wouldn't be, you know, on yeah. a s- specific pace. And I know she's calling She's right. calling to check in, but is she, there's no way she could have called in the last two days. Well, but she, she co- did call she him the night before. She was on the phone when the kid lit the stuff on fire. But we don't know how long, because that was a driving montage ago. That's true, yeah. yeah that um, was a whole driving montage ago. Yeah, I mean, well, because otherwise he would have been at home in Philadelphia, and there's no way he could have gotten to Montana in that amount yeah, of time. Yeah, that's true. It's weird. Outside Vivian's room, Joe and Donald argue for a moment. Joe heads back to his room, while Donald and Vivian argue over the legality of transporting all these minors to Seattle, which... I didn't you have too, this argument already? Yeah, it's okay. too late. And didn't she say yes. she had permission? And didn't you already approve of yes. this whole trip? Why okay. are you mad at her about this now? I, this is the moment that I'm just like, what did, What does Donald want? I have no idea. Because yeah. we. I thought we settled all this already. And I get that he's angry if he thinks that she is with, you know, Joe. Joe romantically, but, yeah. Yeah, but... That's obviously not why he came. Yeah. Because and why was- would she waste money getting two separate hotel rooms if they're cheating on him? Yeah. And then I just like, I from this point on, I am really confused about why he is doing what he's doing with the kids. I yeah. don't get it. And he wants well, her to I, turn around when they've already passed the halfway point. Yeah. I think he's literally just so angry that, that he thinks that they're cheating on him that he was like all right that's it the whole trip's over but i don't know what inspired him to come all the way out here to find that out right because they left town and he was fine with it already and he's a parole officer what jurisdiction does he have over these kids yeah, nothing. anyways and and when he goes into behind closed doors with cicely tyson he starts ranting about i falsified documents and lied to a judge like wait you did what, what happened when did that happen yeah didn't see wh- that. what are you talking about that, that must have been another one of these scenes that ended up getting completely reshot in the middle of the night there's a knock at joe's door and it's vivian they have to get up and go now before donald wakes up to stop them 
We cut to hours later, and Donald is on the road chasing after the bus. He catches up with them on a turn in the forest, and Vivian advises Joe to pull the bus over. Donald and Vivian have another argument on the side of the road, the same argument that they've had a couple times now, and Joe and most of the kids come out too, but suddenly the bus is rolling down the road again without an adult on board. Joe manages to get a grip on the side of the vehicle as it swerves back and forth across the twisty road. Harold, the blind kid, is driving. The rest of the kids pile into Donald's car with Vivian to chase the bus while Joe tries to climb in from outside of it. Samantha is the only other kid left on the bus as she's trying to lift Joe up toward the window. Harold eventually crashes the bus off the road, throwing Joe out into the grass. After he crashed the bus, Harold is having a breakdown because he thinks Donald's going to take them all away and send them to an institution in Philadelphia, which I think is his plan. We kind of glo- we you didn't talk about when they found the kids in the arcade, did you? Was there much more to that? Well, it was just the the joke that Harold was driving. He, oh, I didn't even a, notice that. Yeah, they yeah. were playing a driving game. And they game. were shouting how to turn, and he was the one driving. Now, hard to the left, hard to the right. Okay, straight. So, Which that, is kind of the same thing yeah. happening here, that uh, Pryor is trying to give him instructions like turn, turn, yeah. when they're coming. But he's not giving him a direction to turn in, so it's not as helpful, which is why they go off the road. Kind of reminds me of Robert Redford trying to communicate to david stratheran and sneakers yeah when he's trying to have him drive the car from underneath uh robert redford's on the top of a building and looking from afar david stratheran's character is uh blind oh that's and, right i and, forgot he's, and blind he's trying to me. have to tell him to go no left sorry no my left you're right <laughs> <laughs> the kids all beg donald not to interrupt vivian's plan for seattle she instructs them all to get back on the bus joe gets back in the driver's seat and they leave donald there on the road The same kid who took his wallet before informs Joe that this time he swapped it for Donald's wallet as a joke. I took your wallet and I put it in Donald's pocket. Now I got his wallet and I'm giving it to you, man. Jesus Christ. Look, if you get caught on the highway, you'll be all right. We cut to Donald being arrested by some highway patrolmen who think that he's an ex-con in a stolen car. Hey, call in. Have him check out Joe Braxton, 456-321. During another driving montage, we see that Joe has a smaller illustration of the bus tacked to the dashboard as they cross the state line into Washington. Joe has Harold in his lap so he can pretend to drive some more. They finally reach Vivian's aunt's farm. Joe leads the kids to an animal enclosure and starts chasing a piglet around until Mama Pig comes out of hiding and scares him away. But the kids won't let him out of the closed gate (laughs) so that he can escape. So at this point, I checked the running time. Yeah. It was like, oh... There's okay. a lot of this movie left. I was like, there's like another 40 minutes? What? <laughs> they got here. It's yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> we could fade to black on this moment. We see more clips of Joe and the kids and uncooperative animals. Joe finds Anthony by himself floating a small boat made of twigs in a pond. He's trying and failing to light a match to ignite the boat. Joe tries to have a conversation about Anthony's parents, and the kid starts giving him details. It wasn't my fault. I was standing near the curtains, and I was playing with the match, and they caught, and I tried to wake up my parents, but they wouldn't wake up, and then the fire started spreading, and I just couldn't. Oh, Joe. Anthony throws his arms around Joe and hugs him, crying. Joe reminds Anthony that it was an accident and that nobody means to do things like that. He tells Anthony that he loves him. That evening, Vivian finds Joe walking up to the farm after a long hike. He presents her with a flower, a dandelion. (laughs) He presents her with a rose and tells her about a fish that he caught with Julio. It's not a rose. (laughs) Vivian tries to elaborate on the story of falling out of a tree and scarring her arm. Apparently she was trying to get her cat down, but Joe interrupts her recollections to gift her a rock egg, which is probably just a rock. (laughs) (laughs) That is a rock egg. That's for you. It's magic. It's laid by the rock bird. You mean I can rub on it and make three wishes? You can make as many wishes as you wish. 
The next day, we see Vivian speaking with a banker while the rest of the crowd waits outside. She comes out looking very disappointed, and behind her, the banker's wife shows up in a fancy car with his lunch that he left at home. Later, Joe asks Vivian what's the matter, but she wants to solve the problem on her own. It turns out her family is in dire financial straits, and they have to sell the farm because of property taxes. A piece of information that would have been good to know before she made the trip well i'm assuming that yeah this is she didn't even talk to them about bringing the kids out until she got there yesterday yeah like the taxes that's not like a surprise gotcha kind of thing yeah that you didn't happen know today those are coming <laughs> she wanted to take out a loan to cover the debt but she doesn't qualify because her job was liquidated with the closing of the claremont children's center vivian seems resigned to her loss but joe can't accept that She asks if he has the $15,000 she needs, because otherwise, what's the use? They've already lost. I ain't no goddamn loser. Well, do you have it? Can you give it to me? Do you have $15,000? No, I don't have it! If I had it, you'd have it! I don't have shit but me, but I ain't no loser, and don't you tell me I am! And they ain't losers either! I drove that goddamn bus all the way from Philly! With bailing wire! And I fixed it! And we're here! So don't tell me I'm a loser! I did something once in my life! I'm somebody, and you ain't gonna take that away from me! One of the kids overhears this conversation and tells the other children that they're gonna lose this property and be taken back to Philadelphia. Joe can hear all the kids complaining about it and then immediately begins screaming in their faces. And then (laughs) slaps one of the kids to the ground. Yeah, one, one of them tries to interrupt him, and he, I think this is Ernesto, he slaps him so hard that, yeah, he disappears out of frame. And he doesn't rise back into frame, like he's holding his face on the ground for the rest of this scene. He reminds the kids that they aren't losers, and then he jumps in the bus and he drives away from the farm. In town, Joe walks past the bank that refused Vivian's loan and contemplates putting a brick through the front window before deciding against that. Tacked to a tree outside the bank is a small cardboard sign that reads, Surplus Harvest Cash? Dare to be rich. A seminar by noted financial analyst Professor Winslow T. Renfrew, Ph.D., on the subject, The Trapezoid Approach to Personal Economic Security. Bring cash only. Checks or credit cards not accepted. Joe is enough of a con man to know that he's already not going to make money from this scam, but he also sees a sign suggesting that other suckers bring their cash to the seminar. We cut to the Goose Lodge, number 117, the Royal Order of the Goose, an Elks Lodge variant, Mid-seminar, one of the attendees asks the difference between the trapezoid system and the pyramid scheme. Dr. Renfrew is happy to respond. Now, the pyramid is based on the triangle which has three sides. But the trapezoid has four sides and it is that fourth side which guarantees geometrically and mathematically the enrichment of all those who participate in it. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, thank you. It reminds me of Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where they just flip the shape upside down to throw people off. It's a pyramid scheme. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's a reverse funnel system. Turn it upside down. Oh, God damn shit. it! Shit! <laughs> <laughs> Joe is in the back row of the trapezoid presentation, dressed as a ridiculous cowboy character. Which I think we've already seen from him once. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. I was uh, looking it up. Uh, I forget what movie it is, but he, he does this again in another movie where well, he's wearing a giant cowboy hat. I mean, they do it in Stir Crazy where they're doing the bull riding and stuff, right? He's he dresses, Does he dress as a cowboy? I think so. I can't remember. It kind of reminded me of the MacGyver episode where they're trying to trick the drug dealer. Yeah. And they have the one guy come in all dressed up as a cowboy. And he's got like all this facial hair glued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe asks Dr. Renfro if it's true that he can expect his investment to triple by this afternoon, and the man tells him that within a week, it could grow 20-fold. Joe goes out of his way to sell the program to the other victims in the room, and it's clear that Renfro appreciates this. That's when Joe goes in for the kill. He says that since this is all a legitimate program, that Dr. Renfro would obviously trust him to collect the money from the audience on Renfro's behalf. Then you won't mind if I collect the money. I mean, I'm one of these people. You people don't mind, do you? (laughs) Joe takes a seat at the table at the front of the room with 15 stacks of cash. He notices right away that only the top bills of each stack are legitimate. But it also seems like Renfro sees him notice, which means they're both in on this scam now. Uh, I like that it's like $501,000 bills. I feel like in the 80s, 
thousand dollar bills were like like this even then extremely rare yeah even extremely rare but but it seemed like to be the thing that everyone always had because yeah. I, I just rewatched midnight run and uh there's a whole thing about like having stacks of thousand dollar bills yeah and i was like yeah i guess those exist but it seems like it's like a movie trope to have thousand dollar bills maybe that's just a popular prop but maybe it's too late for renfro to break character and call joe out now that he's already seen the money as scam victims approach the front of the seminar with their own cash, Joe is pocketing the real $1,000 bills from Dr. Renfro's stacks. But again, Renfro sees this happening. He calls to his assistant, Mr. Munjack, and explains the situation privately. Munjack quickly moves to distance Joe from their money. Back at the farm, Vivian decides to head into town to look for Joe. The kids are left alone, and Ernesto notices the fancy car from outside the bank pulling up to the neighboring farmhouse. Martin suggests trashing the car, but Anthony has a better idea. We cut back to the trapezoid seminar, where Vivian has somehow found Joe. There's no explanation of how she could possibly have found him, mm -hmm. because we'll learn here that he sold the bus right. for the money that he's pretending to invest in this program. With. Right. Why did he even need to do that? Did he need to show him money? To I think he just needed a way to buy himself a seat at that table at the front. And so if it's like, outfit. oh, they gave us $1,000, he, he, he must be here expecting to make money well he there's no way he got a thousand dollars for that bus uh, yeah that's true in 1981 did he give him a thousand i can't remember how much he gave him well that's what he well that's what he claims to give him yeah like, here's my first thousand when joe notices vivian peeking through the door he rushes to her and hands off the fifteen thousand dollars that he's pocketed so far before shoving her back out the door she is not picking up what joe's putting down and so even outside the room she fails to leave with the money Renfro's henchmen attempt to apprehend Joe at the door, so he punches one out and then makes a run for it. The crowd turns on Renfro when they see a fight breaking out, and they all try and get their money back. Joe and Vivian try to part ways to escape, but then they loop around a building and crash back into each other on the other side. The henchmen start firing guns at them, Yeah. and they escape again together. They move through the back room of a swap meet. The henchmen make their way through the room full of random junk, and we see in the background that Viviana and Joe are posing as mannequins. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a person posing as a mannequin? The Omega Man? That's right. Yeah. Joe reels back a swing with a bat and then clocks one of the henchmen before he realizes that it's a rubber bat. When the man turns around, he somehow doesn't recognize the two mannequins holding still in front of him as the people he's chasing, and they disappear again when he looks away. Vivian's also got like this goofy smile on her <laughs> yeah. face in this pose, and I'm like, that's not a mannequin like, it's great though you can't <laughs> <laughs> joe tries to move through the room with a lampshade over his head but the rest of his body clearly visible when mr munjack catches him joe puts a novelty light bulb in his mouth that lights up presumably when he touches his tongue to the base of it but munjack is not amused he presses a handgun against joe's face and vivian rushes munjack to tackle him suddenly an older woman and dr renfro enter the same warehouse with more guns where did this lady come from yeah she wasn't at the trapezoid seminar so i'm assuming she was in whatever scene got replaced by the trapezoid seminar because i'm pretty sure the trapezoid seminar was part of the reshoots mm. we get this long drawn out slapsticky moment where the characters are all smashing props over each other joe winds up with a katana and does his best impression of a samurai for a bit until he accidentally tosses the sword across the room on his backswing oh shit I like uh, Vivian's reaction to being assaulted with a plunger. And she's like, are you kidding me with a plunger? Are you kidding me? And she <laughs> just starts slapping him. Munjack grabs Joe by the collar and tosses him into an inflatable raft. Across the room, we see Vivian dumping $15,000 of cash into a furnace, which is lit aflame. It's just an infuriating moment because it doesn't solve any part of their problem. What I thought was going to happen was she was going to hide the money in the furnace and they were going to have to buy it at the swap meet later yeah but that's not what's happening because we could see flames inside of yeah it. yeah no but i thought that that was her plan i was like yeah. oh okay i see what she's gonna do she's gonna hide it in there and then they're gonna have to come back to the swap meet and buy that yeah. pot belly so for a lot of money for some reason <laughs> there's just like one like really stubborn old lady who's like twelve thousand. yeah it's like, why do you want it so badly <laughs> But seriously, burning this money doesn't help at all, except no. to make them angrier and make them want to kill yeah, you more. I mean, like, these guys aren't going to stop coming after you just because you burned the money. Yeah, they're willing to kill you to recover the money. What yeah. do you think they're going to do to you when you destroy the money? They'll be like, well, I guess there's no reason to kill you. Bye. Have a nice day. 
While the henchmen rush to save the money, she drags Joe out the door. He is similarly bewildered as to why she would torch all the cash they need. Vivian starts the farm's pickup truck outside, and Joe hasn't completely gotten in before she pulls away. Well, you forgot the scene where he starts up the giant fan. Oh, yeah. On their way out of the swap meet. Yeah. he It's like a swamp fan, like from the back of one of those boats. Yeah. And it just blasts everything across the room, including the people. It, it's really, like on yeah <laughs> like i mean like this stuff is being just thrown across the room at people i'm sure it's all like super light prop versions of things but even the people are being knocked over by the gust of the wind vivian shouts at joe to jump in the truck before she makes a left turn but then slams on her brakes so that he runs full speed through the passenger side door and knocks it off the truck they drive away together back to the farm and this whole trapezoid seminar bit and presumably the ensuing chase scene was all added in reshoots. Yeah, and she keeps yelling that they're coming for them. Like, they're, they're, they're right behind us, we gotta go. It's like, but we never see them again. We, yeah, you well, never... yeah, because they probably didn't have those guys for that part of the reshoots. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> On the farm, she eventually admits that he as a person is worth more than $15,000 to her, which is the nicest thing that anyone's ever told him in his life. Ain't nobody ever told me I was worth no $15,000. My daddy used to say, boy, you ain't worth a quarter to you. You say that to me? You set me on fire. It's like, really? We're going to talk like this again? And again, maybe that's part of the reshoots and they did it on purpose because they didn't want to shy away from what happened. But it just feels really weird in this moment. They suddenly notice the fancy car from the bank is parked outside the farm now. They rush to the door where they find the banker and his wife saying goodbye to the children. It turns out the kids went to speak with them and told them about their adventures from Philadelphia and all the wonderful things that Joe and Vivian have done for them. Despite all the nice things they've actually done, it sounds like the kids made up a bunch of outlandish deeds to attribute to them. Hitchhiking 300 miles in a snowstorm when your bus broke down. And then sitting up all night for a week with little Linda when she had the fever. Helping Harold learn Italian in Braille. Molto grazie. (laughs) <laughs> just as the banker and his wife are getting to the point donald and the police roll up with sirens blaring donald informs the police that joe is in violation of his parole and vivian and the children are all to be sent back to philadelphia vivian asks donald if he has a warrant for her arrest and he says that he doesn't so she says she's not going anywhere but it's not like he couldn't have gotten a warrant like if she's actually committed crimes like he's claiming then he should have been able to get a warrant right but just coincidentally he didn't no. I'm not going back. She's staying. And who the hell are you? That's Mr. Schuyler, our town mayor. So he's the banker and the mayor mm-hmm. and their neighbor. Donald is still threatening to apply for warrants to arrest Joe and Vivian when the mayor announces that he's going to have all the children registered to this state and he's going to approve Vivian's loan to buy the farmhouse. The kids celebrate, and in an effort to appease Donald, Joe offers to at least go back with him and serve his time in jail. But I, the kids I, beg him to stay. I think it's a little strange that he's tossing around so much power as a small town mayor. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it would be like the mayor from Jaws, like saying, I just have to make one phone call and they'll be, and this will be done. It's like, these will all be citizens of my yeah, fine city. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't, I don't think a small town mayor has that much clout. I, I don't know. I also think it's weird that the kids were able to convince him that he should give her this loan like her qualifications to get a loan have not changed and Mm -hmm. presumably she she, can't pay this back well she yeah she's not making any money and she's got to now take care of eight children eight eight children and she's she's got to pay this fifteen thousand dollars out immediately so and she's also inherited the paramania from that one kid so she now just burns money when she gets it i just like you know I, I maybe she didn't tell the the banker all of the all of the things that she was planning to do at the farm with the kids and stuff like that. So like maybe he has, you know, a soft spot for the kids now that he knows about that. Yeah, but, I I expected it more to be not the loan is approved, but I bought the farm for you because I'm a rich banker man and I yeah. have this fancy car and I can do things like that. But well, they wanted her to be to have more agency and to, for it to be like I'm going to help you help yourself, not. What, okay. But what I thought the plan? was what's the plan? Yeah. Put these kids to work. Well, they're, they're, I feel like, and I can't remember the exact way he phrased it, 
when he says, I'm going to give them a loan to keep things operating. And like he says it in some kind of way like that. Like it was like, wait, what operations? Well, yeah, so it's like going to go through farm? the farm. You sell some eggs, you sell yeah. some bacon, you know, um, so some that's rock an operating eggs. farm. Uh, again, once again, I also predicted how this scene would go incorrectly where I thought um, that the wife was going to be actually the one in in charge of the bank. Oh, okay. Like, like, oh, he he's running the bank, but it's her. Yeah, bank. he's my assistant manager. He works during the day. And yeah, yeah. Like he uh, he's my husband, but he works for me, and I make the final decisions on loans. Yeah, I thought that that's how that was going to go. Been better. Like it, it appealed to her like maternally. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that doesn't happen either. Maybe they could just have a reality show, Joe and Vivian plus eight. Those make money, right? It's the only reason people have more than five children anymore <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> to be like, on reality TV. If, if we're entertaining enough as a family we can make money from a and e not a and e bravo every channel tlc every every <laughs> cable channel has a show with a giant family i don't know i haven't had cable in i don't 10, what channel is uh years. 19 kids and counting on <laughs> it's one of those right tlc isn't it is it the same as john and kate plus eight yeah are they all on the same I think most of them are on TLC. Does TLC stand for the Litter Channel? <laughs> I think those are all Discovery. <laughs> that reminds well. me of my tweet about starting a reality show about vampire comedians called 19 Counts and Kidding. <laughs> 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 Which they eventually made, but they called it What We Do in Shadows. It's different. But. <laughs> it's What We Do in the Shadows. Is it? It is. Interesting. Are you sure that's the name of the show? Weird. What did you say the title was? Uh, what We Do in Shadows, which is no, what I thought it was No, it's called. definitely in the shadows. Yeah. Interesting. In an effort to appease Donald, Joe offers to at least go back with him and serve his time, but the kids beg him to stay. Linda presents him with a letter from all the children. Dear Mr. Braxton, we the children of this house pardon you for the crimes you have done because we know you as sorry you did that. Yeah, three. We wish that we grow up, we are fine people just like you. From this day on, you are off parole and nobody can stop you no more. This is, this is real special. <laughs> Donald grants Joe a minute to say his goodbyes to the children. Before he leaves, he pulls Vivian aside and she reminds him to stop swearing one last time. He tells her that he loves her, and they kiss. Joe gets in Donald's car, and they drive 100 feet down the driveway before Donald stops. Get out. Go on back home. When the kids see him step out of the car, they freak out in celebration and rush to hug him all at once. Joe and Vivian hug one last time, and we get a spin transition to a title card to credit each child. Julio, Harold, Ernesto, Anthony, Linda, Annie, Martin, Samantha the end uh it's also clear that uh in one of the takes donald was supposed to continue driving away after after he gets after joe gets out because in several scenes when he's hugging the kids the car is there and then then it's gone then it's suddenly gone (laughs) that's weird (laughs) i found a letterboxd review of this film that included some rather dubious claims but i felt like reading them anyway and then pointing out the parts that don't pass the sniff test for me this person said my scenes were edited out of this movie but I did have the role of Blinky, the special needs kid who had a pathological obsession with snails. I remember fondly shooting my subplot where I would recklessly follow snails into dangerous places, i.e. <laughs> a high up window ledge or beneath a precariously placed box of anvils, only to be rescued by Mr. Braxton at the last instant. In the script, Blinky did not make it to the farm because he was randomly killed after following a snail across a highway, a scene Pryor himself thought was a little too dark. <laughs> now, first of all, they never leave the ground floor of anything. Yeah. So he's not he's never in a window following a snail, but also a box of anvils. <laughs> you keep those in bags. Yeah. Or at least a net. But there's only hung. <laughs> yeah a net of anvils <laughs> but there's there's eight kids there's eight kids the whole time there's no way that you could have cut around a ninth kid randomly and also it completely ruins the story of one of them died along the way yeah 
But so, I, I like I like it. I'm glad that this person claimed this, but I don't believe it for a second. <laughs> and that his name is Blinky. Yeah. Um, I think this is my favorite uh, prior performance so far. I definitely prefer it to Stir Crazy and his cameos in the other two religious movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he actually has some heavy duty acting to do here, and I think it's it's a decent story. Um, but yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, I I liked it. Um, it's a thumbs up for me. I, I think that my issue with it is, is, is that it's a little meh, sure. you know, like it just doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't have anything super special or unique to me. It's fairly predictable yeah. in everything that happens. So it's not that it's a bad movie. I just wouldn't put it in as a great movie. Sure. I, I think it was an effort by the studios to portray Pryor in a family-friendly light and to say he can do this kind of movie too. Um, and I, I think the the disjointed Donald character is probably a result of the reshoots or yeah. l- general restructuring of the story over time. But um, I, I do think that he has some really sweet moments with the kids. And I think that uh, even though, even if some of the kids get you know short shrifted a little bit like ernesto and martin really don't get to do anything um it's mostly about everybody else um but i guess martin is the one that's stealing and swapping wallets Mm -hmm. so that's the only thing he gets to do and then ernesto just gets slapped that's all he gets for the whole movie (laughs) um i don't even know what like his problem would be if he's like a special needs Mm -hmm. kid other than he took that tv apart but we don't like explore that at all yeah so maybe maybe Ernesto had a story that was taken out of the film. Um, maybe he had a best friend Blinky who got killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where they Ernesto was filling in for Blinky after they rewrote that part. Um, but yeah, I I still enjoyed it. Um, it is a little bit meh, but I think that Richard Pryor was funnier in this than he has been in the other things we've seen yeah. so far. I, and, there, and like I like I mentioned, there was definitely a couple moments. I think you know when he was after talking to Anne and or Annie and you know at the end when he's reading that letter where I'm like this is you know this is this will choke you up a bit you know like this is this is intense you know he he did a good job I just think that you know overall the movie you know I guess it could have been a little more interesting I also think the child acting is spot on no like all eight kids did a great job like the Samantha girl when she's screaming at him through the window, like she's just like perfectly annoying in that moment, but she cares only about her teddy bear when it needs to go to the bathroom. And uh, even Anthony, the the pyromaniac kid, when he's like having his troubles and he's trying to relay his story, it really doesn't sound like child acting to me. It sounds like this kid like just did a really good job of of taking over the role of this character. Um, I feel like that scene doesn't necessarily work just because of the writing. Um like it could have been one of those moments where you kind of choked up a little bit, yeah. but it just plays off as like, yeah, we kind of wrote the rest of the story already in our heads. We didn't need to hear them go over it again, but, um, but I guess it's a closure for the character. Uh, I like the film. Okay. Um, there were definitely some strange issues throughout um, where I don't know if some of the scenes were more improvised uh, because there's definitely a moment where Cicely Tyson just plain forgets the character name of Joe Braxton, and and she's trying to say Mister Braxton, like, and I was like, <laughs> did you did you forget the character's name? Uh, that was weird to keep in. Well, I uh, mean, she could conceivably forget this guy's name. Yeah. Um, I I would have liked maybe. I like that we ha- opened with a con and we kind of end a little bit towards the end with a con. I would have liked a, a midway con where like maybe they need to get some gas, but they're out of gas money yeah. and, and he has to do some kind of thing or the kids help him. I also like that it's a con on con men. Yeah. So that it's like that he's using his skill set, but he's using it against the evil people. Yeah. I, I, w- I would have liked to have seen a scene where he includes the kids in a con. Like yeah. he uses them as a distraction while he's like trying to siphon gas. Or... What's funny though is that he's still taking money from innocent people at the end. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, as yeah. much as he's ripping off con artists, like that money still came from people who thought they were just making it an investment. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the money's all gone now. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, <laughs> it's it, all on it fire. It would have been gone either way though. That's true. That's true. But at least I would have felt good that it went to something without this like 
deus ex machina of yeah. the rich bankers live next door and they're going to give us money uh I don't know. I, I, the I, rock egg hatched and it's full of diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> we can I, buy the farm. I, I feel like there there needed to be some 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 less handouty yeah. ending like like they were going to do something or or figure something out. Yeah. I mean I felt that way too when I'm just like, "Oh, the kids just explain their situation and the and that's it. Well, they lied about the situation. But, well, or they lied about it. Well, either way, the kids just walked up to these people, told them a story, and now everything's fine. I really wanted the kids to actually even just save the day themselves. Like, not just... Yeah. We t- and he's just like, I found $50,000. And they're like, wait, where did you get this money? Oh, God. <laughs> that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I mean, they- She's like, it doesn't matter. We have enough money for the farmhouse. No, no, it matters, Annie. Oh, like a bake sale. They sold <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah. of like blackberry pie or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, you want to just have a have a car wash montage yeah. at the end of the movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like drive out to the middle of nowhere. We'll wash your car and then you'll collect dust all the way back down the road. Um... I feel weird. I kind of want to give, I think I'm going to give this movie a thumbs down. Um, but it's a very thumbs middle. (laughs) I'm I'm giving it a thumbs up. If that, okay. That changes. That's fine. Then I feel, I feel better about that. (laughs) I I give it a thumbs up. Cause I, I I think there are people that I'd be like, yeah, you should watch this movie. It's not the best movie, but it's, you know, it's super family friendly. And And I just like seeing Richard Pryor in this role. I, I just got, it check it, it checks some boxes like for the family friendly with the underage prostitution <laughs> and the and, and the strip slaps. poker with children yeah. and <laughs> child abuse. And it's as family friendly as movies got in the eighties. <laughs> I do think like even now the way he reacts to Annie's like flirting with him mm-hmm. would be viewed as like inappropriately harsh because he what he should have been like is like okay we need to have a conversation because what you're what you're describing is inappropriate not like what the hell is wrong with you yeah, how yeah, dare yeah. you yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like no that, that'd probably be frowned upon now to react that way but at the time it was like you responded beautifully that was so beautiful <laughs> when you told her to shut up and stop hitting on you <laughs> um yeah uh where's this going letterboxd richard uh i have it at 37 okay uh, which puts it below the Devil and Max Devlin, but above on the right track. Jessica, I have it at uh, a little higher, number thirty, which put, which puts it below on the right track and above the burning. <laughs> I have it in twenty fifth place, which is above on the right track and below the burning. Ah. So I have the same three movies in order, but flipped. Yeah, flippity. I mean, they're all, they're all right about there. I think yeah. that makes sense. Our director here was Oz Scott for the the first pass of the movie. Um, this was his first directed gig. He has mostly TV afterwards, including forty episodes of The Jeffersons, some Cosby shows, and more recently he's directed an Agents of Shield, a couple episodes of Gotham, and eight episodes of Black Lightning. Uh, the uncredited director who came in and did another half of the movie, Michael Schultz. Before this, he had directed Cooley High, Car Wash, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and Scavenger Hunt. He's back later this season at the helm of Carbon Copy and later directed The Jerk 2, which was a TV movie with Mark Blankfield as the, the jerk character, and The Last Dragon. He also directed a handful of young Indiana Joneses, uh, some Ally McBeals, some Chucks, an episode of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Arrow, Blackish, New Girl, uh, and most recently he also directed a few Black Lightning episodes. I don't know what Black Lightning is. It's a black superhero character. Oh, okay. Um, is it uh, on now? Or was this years ago? It might be off the air now. It was. It was fairly recently. 2018 was its first air. Okay. Is it still on? Uh, it's so 2018 a... to 2020, but oh, okay. that could be COVID related. Yeah. Who knows. The adaptation from story to script was done by Lonnie Elder III, who previously wrote the screenplays for Melinda, Sounder, and Sounder Part Two. The story, as I said before, was from Richard Pryor, who also plays Joe Braxton in the film. Writing-wise, before this, he wrote for his own comedy specials, and he wrote Blazing Saddles, which he would have starred in if he were not uninsurable at the time. So far on the podcast, we've seen him acting in Holy Moses, In God We Trust, and Stir Crazy. He'll show up later in The Toy, Superman 3, Brewster's Millions, and more Gene Wilder team-ups. His last film was David Lynch's Lost Highway, but his last appearance as a character 
was on Norm MacDonald's sitcom Norm in 1999. The screenplay came from Roger L. Simon, who previously wrote The Big Fix with Richard Dreyfuss, but I didn't recognize a lot of his other credits. Uh, I have a Roger Simon anecdote. Oh, do you? <laughs> um, uh, I think this may be like the real first time that I have like, it's like, I seriously have had many conversations with this man. Oh, interesting. Um, he worked out of our office for about a year uh, doing uh, some rewrites on a, on a screenplay. Oh, okay. And so I, I had plenty of time to talk with him. He had an office. I saw him every day. Did he write in the office? Uh, he did. Oh, yeah. interesting. He, he preferred to to be in the office space. Huh. Um, and uh, he's was, he was a pretty intense guy. Uh, uh, very intelligent. So a lot of the stuff he would talk about kind of went over my head, uh, <laughs> especially because especially I'm not super political and he's very into politics and yeah. things like that. And so I was just like, when he's talking about people, I was like, all right. I am ashamed that I do not know who these people are. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, I was just like, okay, I actually have a, <laughs> Interesting. a reasonably close connection. Uh, the music was from Mark Davis, who also composed Cheech and Chong's next movie for us last season. Songs, as I said before, Roberta Flack performs the theme song for the film. She's a celebrated American singer known for her number one singles, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face, and killing him softly with his song before only u2 and billy eilish she was the first artist to win the grammy for record of the year two years in a row 73 and 74 i think that i know her songs best from uh remakes of her songs right yeah i was thinking that as Mm -hmm. i was singing them yeah yeah that that her version is definitely not the one that would come to mind cinematographer dennis dalzell uh mostly tv before and after this film but he also lensed hard country earlier this season hard country out here uh the editor here uh one of the editors there's three credited editors uh probably because it changed so much the first one is david holden who previously cut the warriors and the long riders his most recent editing credit was for eight heads in a duffel bag which is a fun little dark comedy that holds a special place in my heart for whatever reason i really like that movie uh another of the editors was harry karamitis uh after this he cut the jerk two Children of the Corn, Back to the Futures 2 and 3, Richard's favorite, Man of the House, Jesse's favorite, Judge Dredd, <laughs> and my favorite, Beethoven 3. Wait, what? <laughs> I don't know. I needed one. Cicely Tyson played Vivian Perry. She was Ophelia Harkness on How to Get Away with Murder and nominated for five Emmys in that role. She was Sipsy in Fried Green Tomatoes and Constantine Jefferson in The Help. She was one Grammy short of a Pigot with a Career Achievement Peabody, three Emmys, an Oscar nomination and Lifetime Achievement Award, and a Tony for The Trip to Bountiful in 2014. She was married to Miles Davis at the time that they shot this film, and supposedly Pryor had been flirting with her a bit on set until Davis phoned him up to remind him that she was spoken for. And then he stopped. Tyson was 16 years older than Pryor, but outlived him by nearly as many years. We just lost her in January of this year, and she was 96 years old. But Pryor passed away at 65, so very young. Angel Ramirez Jr. played Julio. Uh, This was a big year for Angel. We've now reviewed his first three films, all from 1981. He was the heir to Christopher Walken's fortune in The Dogs of War, the homeless kid that he wrote down as his uh, next of kin. Uh, And he was also the brother of the pregnant girl that Paul Newman coached through childbirth in Fort Apache, the Bronx. (laughs) Okay. His fourth film is also on our schedule for this season as Wild Boy in Wolfen. Janet Wong played Annie. Aside from this, her only other credit was as Miss Scarlet in Clue 2, which is apparently a game that you somehow play on your VCR. (laughs) Like a choose-your-own-adventure tape situation. Okay. Awful. (laughs) <laughs> you try to find the next place you, you're, you're you're, the be. whole time you're spoiling everything <laughs> yeah. for yourself mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like if you had to speed read the book as you're flipping through to the pages <laughs> robert christian played donald uh he was coming off of and justice for all in 79 and we'll see him later this year for prince of the city george co played dr wilson t renfrew uh, he was one of the not ready for primetime players, the originals. He was the first cast of Saturday Night Live. He plays Dustin Hoffman's boss in Kramer vs. Kramer. He was Faye Dunaway's doctor in The First Deadly Sin last year, the one that Frank Sinatra kept throwing against a wall angrily. Uh, he was Ben Cheviot on Max Headroom, or Chevio on Max Headroom. He was Senator Howard Stackhouse on The West Wing. He did some voices like Einstein's on Celebrity Deathmatch. 
He's Adam Sandler's dad in Funny People. He voices Wheeljack in Transformers Dark of the Moon, but to my generation, he's probably best known for his final credit as the voice of Woodhouse, butler to Sterling Archer, who passed away in 2015. Aww. Bill Quinn played Judge Antonio Ranzulli. He's Sam in The Birds. He's McCoy's father in Star Trek V, and we'll see him next as Ernie in Dead and Buried later this season. Roy Jensen was the clan leader. That's the guy that, that gave me... Uh, slim pickens vibes he's mulvahill in chinatown he's donovan in soylent green he was lee mendenauer in tom horn last year he was blue in fooling around and moody in any which way you can he's also back seven episodes from now in demonoid messenger of death later this season peggy mckay played gladys schuyler she was the grumpy mrs grimes in amy earlier this season she's likely best known for her 1689 appearances as caroline brady on days of our lives well who is gladys schuyler is she the banker's wife yeah mm -hmm. oh okay <laughs> when i started to read that i almost said she's best known for her 1689 appearances <laughs> on days of our lives that shows older than people think <laughs> they handle the witch trials live <laughs> Nick Dimitri played Frank Munjack. He was a chaos agent in the nude bomb last year. Next year, 1982, he shows up in My Favorite Year, They Call Me Bruce, and 48 Hours. Gary Getzman was the store manager from the beginning, another close personal friend of Richard Wells, <laughs> and longtime producing partner of Tom Hanks. We saw him earlier this season as a newscaster in The Incredible Shrinking Woman, and last year he played the cousin of Melvin Dumar in Melvin and Howard. Joe Jacobs was the watchman i think that's the guy from the aborted scene at the beginning of the film who's watching television in the office we saw him earlier this season as a customer with a violin in gene hackman's supermarket in all night long there was a customer with a violin yeah i mean I it's middle that. of the night everyone's being weird in the store and he's walking around playing a violin while he's shopping yeah i think i just blocked out that movie Paul Mooney played Marvin, another hilarious comedian, a longtime writing partner of Pryor's. He also wrote for In Living Color, Roseanne, and Chappelle's show, on which he appeared regularly. My favorite quote was from when someone asked him why white people like Wayne Brady so much. White people love Wayne Brady because he makes Brian Gumbel look like Malcolm X. <laughs> And then later, when Wayne Brady guessed it on the show, they did a whole training day bit where he tricked Chappelle into taking PCP. I make Brian Gumbel look like Malcolm X, huh, motherfucker? <laughs> 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 I'm Wayne Brady, bitch! <laughs> it was Mooney! <laughs> <laughs> it was Mooney! <laughs> Vincent Price played alcoholic mechanic scenes deleted Aww. that's a bummer apparently he shot a scene that was cut from the film uh his scenes have never turned up anywhere but i was able to find pictures of him in costume on set and contemporary articles about him being on set some bits of trivia mention that only his back is visible in the final film but i don't see any part of him in the scene in question which is when prior is fixing the bus before they've left philadelphia mm. okay but wh why would he be in this film uh, because Richard Pryor specifically asked for him. Oh. Okay. Because he was a fan for whatever reason. What, what do you mean for whatever reason? It's a price. Because there's so many reasons to choose from. Yeah, okay. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Saved it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly, this is his first appearance for the podcast that we did discuss his appearance in The Last Man on Earth during our recent Omega Man review. He'll be back right around the corner for The Monster Club. Price is obviously part of Hollywood royalty with an emphasis in the horror and sci-fi genres with leading roles like the original House of Wax, The Fly, House on Haunted Hill. Uh, he partnered with Corman for a series of Edgar Allan Poe adaptations inspired by the Hammer Films exploitation of public domain horror. Harvey Har Corman? Harvey Cor No. <laughs> Roger. No, not Roger that, but Roger. Price also has a sizable comedic output for roles like Egghead from the Adam West Batman and Dr. Goldfoot in Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine and Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. He's also a prolific voice actor, having narrated Tim Burton's short film Vincent. He's also the voice of The Mirror in Shelley Duvall's fairy tale theater Snow White episode. One of his last roles was as the inventor of the titular Edward Scissorhands in another of Tim Burton's films. Possibly his best film? Is that a hot take that that's Tim Burton's best movie? I think that I think that could be 
uh, that argument could be made? I think it's that or Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Not Ed Wood? I like Ed Wood a lot, but in terms of movies that I could put on at any time and I would watch from beginning to end every time that I start them, it would be one of those two for me. And Ed Wood isn't very quote-unquote Burton-esque. Right, yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily in his style, but but I do love that film. and I think mm. he did a phenomenal job with it, but but uh, yeah. Uh, do we have... Uh, I can't remember if IMDb still has it uh, for Vincent Price. Sorry, I know we're spending a lot of time on Vincent Price. Oh, I don't mind. actually <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> um, for some it's reason. okay. This is all going to be a deleted segment, too. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, I'm not going to cut him out of ours. Then? He didn't get to be in the movie, so I'm not going to cut him out of our episode. Okay, well, for some reason, I can't bring up his IMDb page. It just He doesn't have one. He wasn't actually in anything. He got deleted out of every movie. Oh, okay, no. Uh, great. So it is still, his last credit is still The Thief and the Cobbler. Uh, the Which he film. recorded like 40 years prior. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like one of the first people they recorded and it took 30 years for them to finish this movie. I'm impressed that they kept his voice though of the entire cast because a bunch of people got replaced. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sean Connery recorded for it for a while. And yeah, all those people got replaced out. I just saw some, uh, somebody did scans from that movie that were like up res to 4k and it's phenomenal because the oh. frame rate of the animation is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really impressive. Craig Richards played the courtroom bailiff. He's also uncredited. This was his first credit, but he's back as an attorney and buddy buddy later this season. I can't speak to the legitimacy of these credits, but IMDb has him uncredited as Kenny G fan in Wayne's World 2, a businessman in My Girl 2, a gambler in three Briscoe County Jr. episodes, a quarry worker in The Flintstones, and Billy's bar buddy in Jurassic Park 3. I, I feel like this is a situation where he was an extra and didn't get credited, but he's on top of his IMDb and he keeps yeah, yeah, things yeah. updated. Um, so I believe all those credits, none, none of that is super outlandish. And I love that he got to be in three Briscoe County Jr. episodes. Very jealous. I was hardly in any. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everything for Bustin' Loose. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Whereas I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Because this is our first episode of the month again, I wanted to remind our listeners about our Patreon campaign. We'll always be free, but if it's worth it to you, a donation as small as a buck a month is greatly appreciated. $5 patrons will get a shout-out on the show and a monthly exclusive episode reviewing a title from the 70s and a hand in choosing each month's film. As an added bonus this year, we're starting to fill in some of the blanks from last year with about 20 minisodes reviewing titles that didn't make the cut from 1980. Joining now unlocks 21 full-size 70s reviews and 16 minisodes. From October of 1971, our $5 patrons are choosing between the following eight titles. Bunny O'Hare, Gerd Oswald's comedy film about a pair of senior citizens who pose as hippies and go on a crime spree led by Ernest Borgnine and Betty Davis. The Captain Bunny O'Hare? Bunny, I Captain like Bunny O'Hare. <laughs> Every time you say that, that's 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 what I sing in my head. Well, he is a bunny. <laughs> Captain Apache, Alexander Singer's acid western starring Lee Van Cleef as the titular Captain Apache, a Native American U.S. cavalryman who must foil a plot to assassinate President Grant. French Connection, William Friedkin's adaptation of Robin Moore's 1969 novel of the same name, adapted to the screen by Shaft author and screenwriter Ernest Tidyman, It starts Gene Hackman as Popeye Doyle, a New York City cop looking to bust a drug smuggling operation. Last Picture Show, Peter Bogdanovich's autobiographical coming-of-age film, set in a small Texas town, starring Timothy Bottoms, Jeff Bridges, Ellen Burstyn, Ben Johnson, Cloris Leachman, and Sybil Shepard. The Organization, the third installment of Sidney Poitier's Virgil Tibbs trilogy after In the Heat of the Night and They Call Me Mr. Tibbs, this time... Tibbs is entrusted with breaking up a ring of urban revolutionaries, including a young Raul Julia. A Town Called Hell, also known as A Town Called Bastard. Robert Parrish's Spaghetti Western, starring Robert Shaw, Telly Savalas, Stella Stevens, and Martin Landau. Women in Cages, Gerardo de Leon's women in prison sexploitation film, produced by Roger Corman, and starring Jennifer Gann, Judy Brown, and Pam Greer. Zeppelin, Etienne Perrier's British World War I film about protecting the Magna Carta from a German raid on a Zeppelin and starring Michael York, Elke Summer, and Peter Karsten, each of which will be celebrating their 50th anniversaries this October. 
We also have a Discord now. Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at vintagevideopodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Four Seasons, which IMDb describes like so. Three middle-aged wealthy couples take vacations together in spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Along the way, we are treated to midlife, marital, parental, and other crises. We leave you now with the trailer for the four seasons. Is this the fun part? Are we having fun yet? Through winter. (laughs) Spring. (laughs) Summer. Oh my God, the boat's moving. You go ahead, folks. I'll catch up. And fall. I wonder what other people do on their vacations. Somehow, they survive it all. Alan Alda, Carol Burnett, Len Cario, Sandy Dennis, Rita Moreno, Bess Armstrong, and Jack Weston. Friendship is like the seasons. The Four Seasons, written and directed by Alan Alda. I wonder if it's a series of VHS tapes. The clue, clue thing? Two. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking that Like it would be a library? On yeah, a... so it's like, go to tape seven, and then you... Like... That's a lot to ask someone to buy at the checkout line. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. nobody was like waiting on this thing to come out. I mean, obviously, if DVD would have made it so much easier with chapters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the only way you could do it was if you had a VCR with like a, a counter. That, that you would that... zip to like, go to five minutes in for yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Or just gives you an amount of seconds. Like, hold down, fast forward for, I don't know, a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we already got your money. We don't fucking yeah. care. <laughs> or, or no matter what decision you make, the same thing happens. <laughs> you yeah. selected either stab him or run away. <laughs> but he tripped you first. <laughs> right. That's all we got. You're still recording. <laughs>